Welcome to the FUMS Now podcast show, where you'll gain information, inspiration, and motivation for living your best life with multiple sclerosis. Find us online at FUMSnow.com. I'm your host, Kathy Reagan Young. Before we get to today's guest, I just want to take a quick minute to give a shout out to another show on the Offscript Network, The Heart of Healthcare. Host Hallie Tecco is a healthcare investor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist who deconstructs the underlying problems in our healthcare today and identifies how we can work together to solve them. Genius, right? She interviews people like Mark Cuban about how he's working to bring down and contain prescription drug costs, Charlemagne the God on helping others heal, and a full range of topics like using zip codes as health predictors and asking the question, is cancer preventable? Super interesting. Be sure to check out The Heart of Healthcare with Hallie Tecco. Look for the link in our show notes. Hello and welcome to another episode of the FUMS podcast show. I appreciate you sharing your precious time with me. Today, I'm talking with the lead author of a groundbreaking study linking the Epstein-Barr virus to multiple sclerosis. But before I introduce you to him, I want to remind you that I send out a great email newsletter every Tuesday called the FUMS Six Pack that features the top six topics in MS from that week. It's full of clickable links to stories, articles, research, etc. all the latest happenings in MS. Get on that email list at FUMSnow.com slash get the scoop. Also want to remind you that we have FUMS merchandise like coffee mugs, hats, t-shirts, jewelry, face masks, sweatshirts, all the things with FUMS emblazoned on them. So you can share your FUMS spirit with the world. Go to FUMSnow.com slash shop and get yours today. Okay, let's get to our guest. Shettle Bjornovic is an epidemiologist working at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's focusing on finding risk factors and better treatments for neurological diseases, including MS. He was recently the lead author of a publication on the Epstein-Barr virus and its effects on multiple sclerosis that got us all excited. So welcome to the show, Shettle. So great to have you. Thanks for having me. So great to be here. Thank you. Okay, let's start at the beginning. I'm just interested. What led you personally into epidemiology and, and the study of neurological diseases? Yeah, so I'm originally from Norway, and Norway has one of the highest rates of MS in the world. Right. So I've always been interested in learning more about why this is the case. And about 10 years ago, I started my rotation in neurology during med school. And I met MS patients my own age, and it, met, it made quite an impression on me. Mm -hmm. So I started looking around for groups, conducting research at the university, and I ended up with epidemiology. So. And we're so glad you did, particularly given this latest study. It's so exciting. Yeah, so you were the lead author of this study linking the Epstein-Barr virus to MS. And it legitimately lit the MS community on fire, me included. Can you give our audience kind of a breakdown of that study and of the outcome? Sure. So we did a large study and we were interested in uh, finding more definitive evidence of whether an infection of the EBV virus is causing MS, the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so this is something that's been long suspected in the MS field, um, but it's quite challenging to really find the definitive proof or evidence actually linking the virus to the disease, especially because the EBV is very common mm -hmm. and MS is quite rare, at yeah. least in comparison to the EBV infection. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we did a study uh, over 20 years in collaboration with the U.S. military um, where we could study risk factors among active duty military personnel. And one unique aspect of this study is that we could access blood samples from one of the largest biobanks in the world, more than 60 million blood samples from wow. 10 million people. Because while people are on active duty, they're regularly tested for HIV mm. every second year, more or less. And these samples are stored in a biobank. So then we could go in and see those who developed MS and kind of go back in time, look in their blood samples before they develop the disease and look whether they were infected with EBV or not. And by doing so, we found that an EBV infection was associated with about a 30-fold increase of MS, which is massive. It's Huge. Like, uh, yeah, definitive. <laughs> right. 
I mean, it's a lot stronger than any other risk factor for the disease. And to us, this provides very compelling evidence that the virus is actually the main cause of the disease. Oh my gosh, that's so huge. I had to read that and reread it several times because, you know, as somebody with MS, I've been waiting <laughs> to read something that says we have a cause here. And of course, it's not the only cause. And I, I would love to hear your thoughts. You're much more educated on this than I, but I've always thought of MS, the cause, as being probably, I think of it in terms, I'm, I'm very visual. I think of it in terms of like those, those locks on, on the doors where like this one has to line up, then this one has to line up, then this one has to line up for you to have it locked or open it, right? So, you know, I did have a suspicion of, of EPV or mono because every, every MSer I know had mono or, right? But I always suspected, okay, that's just one component. And then I assumed, you know, environment and then our own physical makeup. Is that, I'm, that's put in incredibly simple terms, but am I on, on track there at all? Because I mean, we can't just point to the EPV, you know, that's not, that's not the, that doesn't answer all the questions, right? Right. I mean, I think that's a great analogy, thinking about all the doors and the locks. So I would kind of think about EBV as the first door and the first lock. And yes. kind of, it seems to me that EBV is a necessary cause, like EBV needs to be there. Yeah. And then the next doors with the genetic makeup, environmental risk factors, vitamin D, all the other things, they play a role later. But to us, it seems like if you're not infected with EBV, it seems like it's very, very unlikely to develop MS. Very wow. unlikely. That's so huge. That is so huge. And it makes me sad that my daughter has recently had mono. <laughs> you know, it makes you... Anyway, I've had my kids on vitamin D because that's all, you know, that I knew to do. And But anyway, so in your study, you used, you know, the word, like you just said, cause, which is so exciting. You are listening to this show on the Offscript Health Radio Network. Yes, I said radio. My name is Matthew Zachary, co-founder and CEO here at Offscript Health. And I wanted to thank you, the listener, for supporting our hosts, their guests, and our entire network of acclaimed shows, limited series, and major documentaries. In doing so, you are helping to fulfill our mission to make healthcare suck less for all of us together. To learn more about Offscript Health and our network of other shows, series, and documentaries, visit offscripthealth.com. That's offscript, no T, dot com. I'm going to quote you. You said this is a big step because it suggests that most MS cases could be prevented by stopping EBV infection and that targeting EBV could lead to the discovery of a cure for MS. Cure. Mm -hmm. People, do you hear me? That word we've been waiting on, cure. Could this finding really help like eradicate MS? I mean, so in our study, like I said, it seems like if you're not infected with EBV, it seems like it's very, very unlikely to develop MS. So the implication would be that if you can somehow prevent the EBV infection from occurring, you could prevent the MS. So that's right. why we're using like a bit bolder statesman than that we usually not very um we're not using that than the science right right but yeah. I, I think we're providing very compelling evidence that this may be the case and if so then through a vaccine or other measures we could actually make a big impact yeah so in my mind you find the culprit that causes something you develop a vaccine problem solved right and i read that Moderna uh, has dosed the first human subjects in phase one clinical trials of their EBV vaccine. This also sounds really big. Am I overreacting to all of this? Because I just think this is so huge on both levels. Is it as big as I think it is? I mean, I think it's very exciting. It's a first step. I mean, it's, it's challenging to develop a vaccine against EBV. Others have tried before, um, but it's very exciting. And it's also a, an interesting coincidence because we didn't know about this before we published our study. And I think it was the same week or so. Yes. Moderna. Yeah. So it's kind Crazy. of interesting, but it's, um, yeah, it's exciting because yes. that would be 
an implication with the, our study, right? And then um, Moderna comes at the same time announcing the trial. So that's very exciting. Right. Yeah. It is so great. It's like the universe going, here you go, MSers. Here's a little gift to you. Although it doesn't really have implications, just to be clear, for those of us, those of us lucky folks who already have it, but it could have a huge impact on the future of MS. And like I said, my kids, right? So my hope would be we get this vaccine and we're vaccinating people against Epstein-Barr and then we're not seeing MS anymore. Am I tracking with that? Is that the way, you know, things could work in the future if all things go correctly, according to studies and whatnot? Right. Yes. I mean, so that would be an implication. Um, but I think, so I think it all depends on how EBV is causing MS and how it actually contributes to disease activity. So we could think so EBV is a very unique virus because you're infected and then you have a lifelong infection. Mm -hmm. So the virus is never eradicated. It's, it persists in the body mm -hmm. in these B cells, immune cells. So then the question is, is EBV only causing MS or is it also lying there dormant and then actually contributing to triggering disease activity? And if the mm -hmm. latter is true, you could imagine that you could also target the virus yeah. even after disease onset which is very exciting. That is super exciting. Oh, I'm so glad I just asked you that question because I just assumed that. And I almost didn't ask you that question because it seems so, you know, obvious, but it's not. That was that was very exciting for those of us with, with it too. Right. Um, so, I mean, so you can think about um, um, antivirals, for example, targeting EBV could be something that's, I think, I know people interesting right now. And you can think about, for example, it's a different disease, but HIV, there's been a huge effort to develop a therapeutic vaccine, right? Yeah. It can actually help people after the infection. So maybe that could be something similar for MS. Who knows? Oh, but it's keeping everything crossed. Yes. Mm -hmm. If EBV is found in 90% of those diagnosed with MS, that means there's a small percentage that have developed the disease without it, right? So is it not, we're thinking it's not necessary for MS, but just, I think, more... it, dep Go yeah. ahead. I think, I think it depends on the, on the numbers you, you read. So I think it's, it's useful to distinguish between uh, mono and an EBV infection. So mono Please. would be a symptomatic EBV infection. Okay. So if you, in most part of the world, people tend to get infected with EBV before the age of 10, young children. And then you usually will not have any symptoms of the disease. But if you're infected in, during adolescence, 15, 16, 17 year old, usually you will develop symptoms. And that's what we call mono. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people, like some people, they will contact us and they say, but I didn't have mono, so this cannot be the cause. But probably they had a, an infection without any symptoms. Mm. And actually, when you look in MS patients and you can measure their antibody levels and you can see if they had a previous infection, close to 100% of MS patients had the infection. Oh. So in, in our study, we had 800 patients, 801 patients, and one single patient did not have traces of the EBV infection. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that's, that's like 99.9%, .9%, right? So that's yeah. a very high number. And a couple of years ago, there was a study coming out of Germany, 900 patients and 100% of the patients had antibodies against EBV. So they wow. all had a previous EBV infection. Yeah. So I think to us, Pretty it seems conclusive. like, <laughs> exactly right. Yes. So I think, I think most people, yeah, it seems like EBV is present in almost all, yeah, close to all MS patients. Wow. But I think like maybe a follow-up question would be, and this is also related to the, to the doors and the locks you talked about earlier, would be yeah. why is not all of them developing MS, right? We have 100% right. of the population with EBV infection, but only maybe, I think one in 200 among women develop MS and maybe one in 400 men, like a lifetime risk. So there's something else going on, maybe in an interaction with other factors like genetic factors, vitamin D, these other things, they probably play a role in affecting how the body responds to the mm -hmm. EBV infection. Mm. So that can maybe explain why not everyone is developing MS, even right. if close to everyone is developing EBV. Yeah, oh, that's so interesting. 
So I appreciate, we appreciate so much uh, the implications for MS and that, that this really speaks to our community, but could these findings have implications for other viral diseases as well? I think, I think there's been some interest because um, by many, MS is considered more a neurological disease. A lot of people wouldn't think about an infection as the cause. Right. And I think this has been until now eye opening to some people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah until now, exactly. Right. So, I mean, maybe it's been eye opening to other people, and maybe people will look at other diseases and kind of see, okay, maybe viruses could play a role here as well. I mean, who yeah. knows? So, it's, yeah, it can open wow. an interest into other research. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is just so exciting. Um, are you working on anything else that the FUMS community might be interested in? I mean, so we're, we're working on follow up on, up on these findings. We're thinking about antivirals to see if we can find an antiviral that can affect the BV and maybe yeah. test it in MS patients to answer yeah. the question if targeting EBV could actually have a positive effect on MS, right? Yeah. So I think that's maybe the main thing we're working oh, on. Oh, that's great. That would be of interest. Okay. And uh, wonderful. Keep going. Thank you for th doing that. And if you need, if you need patience, you know where to come. <laughs> yeah. We will hook you up with some uh, some MSers for sure. Um, you have explained this incredibly well and clearly, and I thank you so much for your time. I thank you so, so much for you dedicating your life to working on these things that are going to make such a big impact on so many people. Thank you for coming here and sharing your findings with us. This is so super exciting. We so appreciate you and your work and for you sharing it with us today. If people want to learn more about you or your research, where can they go? So we have a website, like a Harvard website, so people can go in and find more information about our group, about our studies. Um, we don't have a large social media presence yet, but we're trying to get started. So okay. we have, yeah, we, I can send you a link and you maybe you can post it as well. I will put it in the show notes for sure. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for doing this and for everything that you're doing for all of us uh, on a daily basis. We really appreciate you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Quick shout out to Steve Woodward at podcastingeditor.com for the fantastic work on his podcast, including editing, show notes, and ingenious ideas. If you'd like help with your podcast, whether you're just starting out or an old pro, visit podcastingeditor.com and tell Steve I sent you. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you listening to the FUMS podcast show. Be sure to subscribe to it so you won't miss an episode. You can do that right on the website at FUMSnow.com. While you're there, sign up for the free email list so you'll be among the first to know of any new findings in MS research, new therapies and products, as well as any blog posts and podcast episodes I release. Want to chat with others in the FUMS community? Join us on Facebook at FUMS Now. Thanks again, and don't forget to talk to the stupid disease as it deserves. Tell it FUMS every day.